Um, I begin by describing a broad genre of marginal notes produced in the late 16th and early 17th century. These are the Hebrew annotations of North Italian Jews appended to their Kabbalistic books in Hebrew and Aramaic, both printed editions as well as manuscripts. The period represents a significant turning point in the history of Kabbalistic study in Italy. In the 1550s, several important Kabbalistic books in Hebrew were printed for the first time, most of them in Italy. Moreover, in the 1580s, new forms of Kabbalah emanating from the city of Safed in the Galilee began to circulate in Italy, usually in manuscript, overtaking older systems and methods. This new availability of Kabbalistic information inspired notes and annotations from the Jewish readers of the era. Some general uh, words about these notes. Printed books with handwritten notes, as they are rarely cataloged and even more rarely digitized, are far more difficult to locate and study. For this reason, I only have a dozen or so examples from the period, though I'm certain many more await discovery as soon as I can travel to Europe. Manuscripts, by contrast, are simpler to identify due to the extensive digitization efforts of the Institute of Hebrew Manuscripts in Jerusalem, and thus I can point to almost uh, 100 examples. The annotative activities themselves include, but are not limited to, nota bene marks, interlinear definitions, uh, which in a Kabbalistic context, this is extended to the deciphering of Kabbalistic symbols or allegories, not just uh, definitions of words. Uh, variants, emendations, cross-references to other books and texts, marginal epitome or paraphrase, subject headings, interpretative notes, and sometimes entire commentaries copied from uh, manuscript to the margin. We find these activities in both printed books and manuscripts, though in my experience, marginal epitome is rarer in manuscript and emendations less extensive in print. While the genre is, is, is a diverse one, I found no definitive evidence of Kabbalistic notes reflecting a classroom setting. The study of Kabbalah took place in small informal settings with a private teacher within the synagogue or in the context of confraternities. Perhaps more often, it was simply studied privately uh, by scholars directly from books. Regardless, uh, a, formal, a formal pedagogical tradition was certainly lacking. Uh, though there are brief allusions to informal Kabbalistic lessons, I've yet to find first or second order notes clearly reflecting such reality. And while we do have instances of identical contemporaneous notes, these can usually be attributed to scribal reproduction. We do, however, have several cases of contemporaneous hands annotating a single manuscript. Often, this is the hand of a master alongside those of his students, suggesting some form of collective study or at least uh, scribal work. But overall, I would view most Kabbalistic notes from this time and place as reflective of private scholarly reading or the scribal transmission of such private readings. While there is much more to say about the typology, characterization, and variety of these Kabbalistic notes, in the present lecture, I wish to exemplify the use of such notes for specific research goals. To this end, I will discuss, uh, I will discuss a specific type of note, namely notes that reference Italian or Latin literature. Though they were produced in Italy, the influence of Italian and Latin culture is very difficult to discern in the Kabbalistic notes of the period. Italian Jews, spoke Italian as their mother tongue, learned to read Latin, and read books in both languages. That being said, when it comes to the genre of Kabbalistic notes, evidence of this Italian milieu is very much lacking, most references being to Hebrew literature in print and manuscript. Often, it is only by using Hebrew, Hebrew paleography and codicology that we can even identify a given set of notes as specifically Italian. This silence may be explained by the genre of Kabbalah itself. It is a highly particularistic discourse offering intricate and sometimes arcane discussions of the Jewish God, Jewish practices, and Jewish prayer. It may also reflect a conscious attempt to ignore non-Jewish culture entirely, a, a conservative trend present in many Jewish texts of the time. But though rare, references to Italian and Latin literature do exist, and it is the references in the notes of two annotators, which I will uh, address presently. Let me begin, however, by posing the basic question. When we find such references, what can we do with them besides simply note their existence? So first, their study can obviously help us reconstruct the libraries and interests of different readers. 
In general, this is a question that has long intrigued scholars of Italian Jewish history who saw evidence of the kinds of non-Jewish books read by Jews in various periods. In the past, scholars have chiefly relied on book lists prepared for censors or on references in fully fledged works. I offer marginalia as a third and uh, underutilized method for answering the simple but surprisingly elusive question, what was an Italian Jew reading in the 16th century besides books printed, in, uh, printed or written in Hebrew? But I think it is important to go a step further and not to suffice with simply listing references or reconstructing libraries. For this reason, I would like to focus on the very act of quote, quotation, which takes on a specific significance because of the Christian context in which the Jewish Kabbalist finds himself. It can be argued that to actively cite the source of an often hostile religious other, as opposed to passively reading or surreptitiously paraphrasing it, is not a neutral act. Underlying it may be diverse cultural activities such as conditioned acceptance, utter, uh, utter rejection, subtle appropriation, or some more complex configuration. This being the case, an explicit reference to Italian literature is not just another item in a long list of books cited. If read closely and carefully, it can be treated as important evidence of the often complex literary and cultural interactions between Jews and non-Jews in early modern Italy. I begin with the book of an Italian Jew who signs his name Menachem Immanuel ibn Chanamel da Ravenna. We know almost nothing about Menachem, save that he was writing Hebrew notes in the late 16th century, and that he corresponded with some important legalists and Kabbalists of the period. Uh, all of uh, his notes that I found are in printed books. I haven't found him uh, uh, do extensive annotations in manuscripts, though he did seem to own a few. Among his extant annotated books is the Kabbalistic tract, Marech et Halahut, printed in Mantova, 1558. Marech et Halahut is an anonymous but influential medieval treatise and it was printed with the lengthy discursive commentary of 15th century Iberian uh, Italian writer Yehuda Chayat. Both text and commentary have an encyclopedic scope attempting to broach all aspects of the Jewish Kabbalistic worldview. A cursory look at Menachem's notes shows that he is an intensive reader. Almost every page is filled to the brim with comments, epitomies, and definitions. And unlike most annotators, his notes continue to proliferate unabated all the way to the end of the book. He was also fond of referencing other books. Overall, he quotes about 30 Hebrew sources, legal, exegetical, and Kabbalistic, some of these dozens of times. Menachem does, however, quote some non-Jewish sources as well, uh, eight in total. Menachem's citation habits prove useful for analyzing his sources. He rarely specifies what edition he is quoting. Sometimes he's extremely vague about his source, denoting it using the name of an author or a single word, usually written in Hebrew letters. For instance, he refers to Matteo Silvaticus's medical encyclopedia, uh, Pandectae Medicinae, simply using the Italian padet, pandete, along with the Hebrew word for medicine. However, because he usually provides a folio number, an examination of extant editions allows us to pinpoint the precise edition he is quoting a task made significantly easier by expanded uh, digitization efforts of early modern books. Thus, Menachem points to a discussion of lodestones in the Pandektai, citing folio 136, column three. And indeed, we find the discussion as stated in an edition printed in Venice in 1511, as can be seen here. Using these methods, we can reconstruct Menachem's non-Jewish library with unparalleled accuracy as displayed in this chart. As you can see, five out of the eight books can be identified by edition. Two of these are in Latin, the rest in Italian. What kind of books was Menachem reading? His sources are neither philosophical nor mystical. These are, in other words, not the kind of sources consulted by certain famous Jewish polymaths and Christian Kabbalists in the 15th and 16th centuries, uh, figures interested in affecting a profound, a profound synthesis between Kabbalah, magic, and Neoplatonism. They instead represent a random sampling of scholarly and popular books related to science, medicine, history, and grammar, all printed in Venice, and possibly reflecting the types of things read by an average Jewish reader as opposed to an exceptional scholar. Menachem cites these books in order to draw superficial parallels between the scientific and historical information referenced, referenced in Marechet el 
and uh, corresponding information in Italian and Latin literature. As an intensive reader, Menachem is not only interested in the main Kabbalistic arguments of Marechet Elohut, he reads it to enrich his knowledge of both Kabbalah as well as the wider world. He, for example, uh, uses uh, passages in Marechet Elohut to learn about the habits of lions, the formation of fetuses, and the properties of magnets. In the context of the Kabbalistic work, these details are cited tangentially for the purposes of analogy and metaphor. For Menachem, however, they become the subject of intense focus, inviting him to connect the scientific information to what he has gleaned from his other readings, and often inspiring him to pursue subjects with only a tenuous connection to the main text. At times, it seems as if Menachem is simply looking for excuses to show off his non-Jewish library. Regardless, actual Kabbalistic doctrines are generally allowed to remain undisturbed within a Jewish milieu without any connections being drawn to analogous discussions in Christian or classical literature. I would now like to focus on one note that can prove enlightening as to Menachem's general uh, approach to non-Jewish literature. The text of Ma'arech HaTelhut cites and explains a Jewish legend which asserts the existence of the mythical beasts, the Leviathans, one male, the other female. Lest they procreate and overtake the world, God slaughtered the female and castrated the male shortly after creation. The flesh of the slaughtered female has been salted and preserved and will be consumed by the righteous with the advent of the Messiah. Menachem is quick to search for other texts that echo this idea of not just one, but a, a pair of Leviathans. Uh, Unfortunately, the only source that came to his mind was not part of the Jewish canon, but rather a book of the Apocrypha included in the Christian, but not the Jewish Bible, namely Four Esdras. And indeed, Four Esdras echoes the idea of two Leviathans and the need to separate them. And then you did preserve two souls, the name of one you called Enoch and the name of the second you called Leviathan, and you separated them from each other. For our purposes, more interesting than the fact that Menachem draws this parallel in the first place is the way he presents it. He writes as follows, though one may not bring proofs from the fools, referring obviously to Christians, nevertheless, look as one taking a casual stroll in 4 Esdras chapter 6 in the Biblia Latina, for there it gives the Leviathans two names, one is Enoch and the other is Leviathan. In order to safely turn to the text of a religious other, Menachem is forced to disparage the very comparison that he himself draws. He employs the allegory of a casual stroll, uh, stroll, contrasted with a serious journey, seeking to make light of the comparison. There is an unambiguous anxiety associated with the citation of the Christian Bible. This note should be contrasted to an earlier note, which seeks to glean information about the process of conception from Manfredi's Liber de Homine, Il Perche, as well as from the Italian translation of Quranic and Islamic lore, Lal Corano di Macometto. In neither of these cases does Menachem voice his reservations about turning to the work of the Christian Manfredi, whom he refers to explicitly as a Christian, nor to an unambiguously religious text of Islam. It seems that the anxiety associated with the citation of Esdras is related to content, a discussion not of science, but of a semi-mythical beast, and to the symbolic status of the Christian Bible. It is one thing to quote texts written by an exotic Muslim other who is viewed as an enemy of Christendom. It is one thing to quote religiously neutral texts that happen to be written by Christians or pagans. It is an entirely different thing to quote from a corpus emblematic of the Christian faith. There's much more to say about Menachem, but I would like to move on now to another annotator, uh, the prominent Venetian and Manchuan Kabbalist, legalist, and scribe, Rabbi Ezra de Fano. Fano owned a copy of the Zohar, a 13th century collection of Kabbalistic lore, structured as a commentary on the Pentateuch and accorded near canonical authority in early modern Kabbalah. Fano owned the three volumes of the edition printed in Mantova between 1558 and 1560. Fano is a far less intensive reader than Menachem, and like most annotators, slowly loses interest as the book progresses. His notes are generally more scholarly than those of Menachem, and he only rarely indulges in marginal paraphrase. He quotes several Hebrew books, including many manuscripts, unlike Menachem, who almost only quotes printed books. And uh, as for non-Jewish books, these are far rarer in his notes and amount to no more than three or four sources. It is far more difficult to reconstruct Ezra Defano's library, 
for the simple reason that he's not so kind as to provide folio numbers or even chapter numbers. In the case of non-Jewish literature, he often doesn't deign to mention a book at all and simply refers vaguely to the Christian, a faceless indeterminate other. Thano does not so much cite as he alludes. Thus, for instance, he notes a parallel between the, the way the Zohar interprets a particular word in Genesis with the translation of a Christian who, according to Ezra de Fano, renders esaltatione. Uh, this is incidentally the only place in his thousands of notes where Fano uses Latin script. By examining vernacular translations of the Old Testament, we can conclude that Ezra de Fano is referring to the translation of Antonio Buccioli, which was indeed popular among Jews. But the most striking reference in Fano's notes, one unusual among contemporary Jews and unheard of among Kabbalists, is an explicit reference to Dante's Commedia. In the main text of the Zohar, we find a passage which divides Jewish Gehenna into two distinct chambers, a place of eternal damnation and a place of gradual purgation and eventual liberation. This in and of itself is an important, very Christian distinction, which has been overlooked in the scholarship of the Zohar. But for our purposes, what is important is Ezra Defano's note, which reads as follows. And see Dante in the Purgatorio. And at the beginning of the introduction of that book, you will find the different parts of uh, Gehenna listed. A close reading of this note should focus on identifying what precisely Ezra Defano is referring to, and also take into account the cultural significance of an implied identicality of Christian and Jewish visions of hell. So the first issue, while no folios are provided, Ezra is not strictly speaking referring to the Commedia. He actually cites the introduction to the Commedia. This almost certainly refers to the paratextual materials often appended to the printed, the printed editions of the Commedia in the 16th century, such as the prefaces of 15th century commentator Cristoforo Landino and 16th century commentator Alessandro Bellutello. Bellutello's introduction to the Inferno would have been particularly striking due to its intricate woodcuts depicting the chambers of hell. Moreover, both Velutello and Landino go to great lengths to reify the Dantean hereafter by indulging in almost obsessive measuring and categorizing, referred to by some as infernal cartography. It is not impossible that Fano, more interested in the precise shape and uh, demarcations of hell, and less in Dante's poetic presentation of it, may have read these introductions or at least heard about them, even if he did not necessarily read the poem itself. Note, however, that Fano, unlike Menachem, makes no explicit reference to a, to a page or specific discussion. He's broadly noting the existence of Dante's work. Fano may be, if I may use a, a term taken from the history of reading, a non-reader of Dante. That is, he reconstructs the literary object based on his partial knowledge of it. This, of course, contrasts with Menachem's punctilious citation of specific pages demonstrating a close reading of non-Jewish books. As to the cultural significance of such a quotation, we see here a very specific view of purgatory, not as a matter of confessional doctrine, but as a reified place. Fano's comparison does not seem to be polemical. Instead, he seems to be suggesting an actual identity between the purgatory described by the Zohar and that described by Dante. If this is the case, then purgatory is perhaps being viewed here through a lens of geographic neutrality. It is a place just like any other place. And though Christians and Jews may debate, who precisely is sent where, there's no essential disagreement between the faiths over its very existence. And I assume this is why he does not offer some kind of disclaimer like uh, Menachem ben Hanamel. It is this neutrality which facilitated Ezra de Fano's comparison. I cannot emphasize enough how important this small note is for our understanding of Jewish notions of hell and purgatory in the 16th century, but that is a subject for another occasion. In conclusion, I've tried in my presentation to briefly exemplify how marginal notes can be used to pursue specific goals. My main focus has been close readings of cross-references to non-Jewish literature, showing how these can be used to reconstruct a reader's library and interests, as well as shed light on the broader cultural concerns uh, and religious beliefs of readers that may extend beyond the narrow confines of the margin itself. I see in this an important supplement to and logical extension of broader approaches that seek to define, characterize, and present a typology of the corpora of notes. Granted, closer readings can only be applied to a small subset of notes or marginalia. After all, the majority of uh, Menachem, Ibn Hanamel, and Ezra Defano's notes are very mundane. 
their their uh, their paraphrases and interlinear glosses are far more nu numerous than their citations of Dante and do not have much of a story to tell. But even in an ocean of standard practices that are there are occasional moments of creativity, be it a witty comment or a surprising parallel, offering an opportunity to read a note carefully and closely, viewing it not just as an application of a method, but as a micro text in its own right, which can shed important light on the expectations, assumptions, and beliefs of its writers. Thank you. Thank you very much to the Rabba, Avi, for your fascinating talk, I must say. I'm always very glad when uh, Dante comes popping up. Um, I can imagine there are some uh, questions from our guests. If not, I uh, want uh, to, my, to make a remark myself. Um, it's quite intriguing, I think, uh, that the um, well, that uh, the uh, Jewish uh, readers uh, you presented um, write about the Christian, about uh, who uh, uh, a Christian who uh, presents the uh, other views. Um, it's it makes me think about uh, the Christian Hebrews of the same period who do the same thing, but then with the Jew who uh, presents the uh, the other well the uh, other side of the story, very generalized. Um, I'm wondering where these Jewish readers suspected by their co-religionists uh, because of their reading of uh, Christian literature or, or not, I would like to know. Um, uh, it is, uh, okay, a great question. Um, I would say most Jews read non-Jewish books and that was usually accepted and understood. Uh, things got a little more complicated when you tried to cite or publish discussions of non-Jewish texts in a more public forum. So uh, if a preacher, for example, cited a classical text, he could sometimes get in trouble from his Jewish co-religionists or uh, a book that too extensively dealt with classical or Christian materials might also uh, suffer the same fate. I believe and I, I can't, uh, I, I can't prove this, but I believe that uh, as opposed to annotations in manuscripts, annotations in printed books, at least in the Kabbalistic context, I think represent very private notes. Uh, annotations in a manuscript, because a manuscript by definition functions as an exemplar, so you always have the, the, the assumption that somebody's gonna read it and somebody's gonna copy it and then it's gonna be reproduced. Uh, a lot of these notes, I've never seen them reproduced anywhere and I don't actually know if anybody ever bothered to read them. So I think that, uh, and this may be one of the advantages of reading um, marginal notes in printed books, if I'm correct, that it may reveal a certain undercurrent that we would not otherwise find explicitly stated in Kabbalistic texts. And uh, uh, I didn't talk about it, but I found other, in Menachem ben Hanamel's notes, I found also interesting discussions of heaven and hell that, I, that are unprecedented in, uh, Jew, uh, of in fully fledged works of Jewish literature from the time. That's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, meanwhile, I'll see that there are three questions now. Um, I think uh, David is the first one. So go ahead. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Thank you for that. I just wondered if, um, if you could explain something about references to Italian or Latin literature that uh, in, a, in a broad sense, not necessarily literary work that uh, might not necessarily deal with those encyclopedic or theological issues that uh, came, came out in the uh, specific references to Dante and Girolamo Manfredi. So do you have any references, for instance, to Ariosto or things of that sort that are, are, are put in the margins or are those things completely absent? Um, thank you, uh, it's a good question. I've, I hate to say it, but I might have uh, almost presented all of the non-Jewish sources in this genre of literature in this small lecture. They are very rare. Um, so there's more of them in more like 
books of Jewish history sometimes will inspire more uh, um, a wider variety of notes. But um, again, it's a very rare occurrence that when we find it, we can be very excited because it might uh, represent something broader. But on the other hand, and this is uh, obviously always the, the risk of types of research that we could call maybe micro history is that we're, uh, this is just a exceptional circumstance. It's sometimes unclear. Uh, or references, extent. sorry, references to Aristotle at ah, all, or okay. those, uh, those must be much more frequent, right? Yeah, so Aristotle uh, and especially his reception through the uh, Muslim philosophers such as Averroes and uh, uh, such, uh, that's a staple of Jewish philosophy. So you will find extensive discussions of that, not just in marginalia, but in uh, um, everywhere you look. In, uh, in Kabbalistic books, it's less their interest, but um, I, I, I would, it's at the point, and it has been argued that at this point in Jewish Italian history, those works were basically considered Jewish because they had been so much part of the Jewish philosophical canon that it wasn't even considered the citing a text of another, as opposed to books like Dante, which certainly had not earned themselves such a place yet in the Jewish canon. Okay, next question is by Ray. Um, thank, thank you, Avi, this was terrific. Um, I had just one question and one maybe uh, suggestion, so I'll start with the latter. Uh, you, you said now in your answer uh, that this exposes some undercurrents of, uh, of some kind of connections. And I was just thinking that maybe you should also think of the actual practice of annotating. And again, I'm going back to the manacles that you showed in one of, the, uh, in one of your slides as again an undercurrent of, of, uh, of uh, connections. I, I just don't think we take it as in this conference, especially, but already as early modernists, uh, we take for granted that people write in books, but this shouldn't be the case. And we, and, and we shouldn't assume that everyone would draw a hand. And here you have uh, 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 some guy drawing a hand to point at a mark and you could do it with a million other ways. And um, uh, so if, yeah, so that's just one, one way of, Finding the undercurrent, and the question is: Do you did you ever encounter explicit uh, uh, remarks by your uh, Italian Jews about annotating books? Did anyone say, "Huh, I'm going to annotate this book," or "This seems like such a good idea. Maybe let's start annotating books," or, or any of the things that you do find sometimes uh, among among my people, at least? Yeah. Um, thank you uh, to answer your. First uh, thing first, uh, sorry, just to understand, you, you're saying manicules are an undercurrent because they're uncommon or because- no. Because like... they, they shouldn't be taken for granted. I guess you have, mm. you wouldn't today in the 21st century mark a book with a manicule. And if you did so, it's because you read Bill Sherman's book and you want to be cool. And, <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, so, uh, so there is a, a minute that people start doing this. It's not even so ancient. You wouldn't find this. I don't know any any manuals. Twelfth century or, or before twelfth century, maybe they are. I don't know. And you wouldn't find this too too later. So I, I mean, this is already a cultural practice. It's a very certain cultural practice. As annotations more generally, it's a cultural practice. So. Uh, you're not encounter, encouraged today to annotate a book in the library, and you were not enc encouraged to do this so in the 18th century, but you weren't encouraged to do this in the 16th century. So this, this is already historically contingent. So maybe, yeah. Uh, I've, I've always assumed, uh, perhaps unjustifiably so, that most of, uh, we don't just find manacles, we find obelai, uh, all kind of vertical floral designs, all all kinds of things that I've always just seen in the majority Christian culture from the same period. So I never, I suppose, wondered why the, the Jews were doing it because it seemed like, yeah, they were part of that culture. So they were all, for, uh, interestingly though, one finds far less of it in non-Italian uh, Kabbalistic manuscripts, such as those from the Ottoman empire. I, I don't think I've ever seen a manicule in one of those. Um, as to your, uh, as to people talking about annotating, 
Um, I feel like there really should be. What, I, what I've definitely seen is in a lot of book lists, uh, people will sometimes describe a certain book as an annotated book. They'll use the word in Hebrew, muga, or uh, there's in one case, and I don't recall what word they used, the, they used a certain Italian word for uh, marginalia. So, um, and uh, I think it usually looked uh, upon as a valuable thing. That's, uh, but uh, if I think of something, I will let you know. Okay, if that question is answered, uh, one more last question by Oliver Budai. Yeah, thanks so much for your talk. I was very interested in your remark um, where he's really noting that it's a Christian source and you should be very careful, you should just take a stroll. And uh, you've partially answered my question because I was thinking of the private versus semi-public versus more public nature. Uh, you mentioned gatherings of people reading, so he would bring his manuscript and he would prove by having annotated that you should be very careful that he had noticed the similarity, but maybe that he should be, that he was aware of that. I was also thinking um, about, about the years uh, and the teachers which were noted in other manuscripts. Uh, and that brought uh, to my mind the question of to what extent can we see that um, student notes are, or, or notes in general, are written with a view to leaving a memoria in a way, leaving an autobiographical uh, document because would a humanist uh, having heard a course by Poliziano, would he really write it down to remember that he heard the course in 1492? Or would he want others who inherit his manuscript want to know that he heard it at the time? So I was wondering whether you had found any notes which suggest that uh, the authors you looked at like to shape their like afterlife or their memory by these annotating practices? Um, thank you. That's that's an excellent question. Uh, the I always look for uh, second person type notes, such as go look here, go do this, go check this. Though it's almost a, a, just a style of writing at that point, so I, I'm not sure how conclusive it is. Um, I will note that there were some Kabbalistic annotators that must have been aware that their students kept taking their notes and copying them. Because uh, there's one particular Kabbalistic uh, uh, annotator whose notes uh, account for almost like, uh, I would say, almost 50% of the annotated manuscripts, his Menachem Azaria Defano, not related to Ezra Defano. And his notes get copied so many times that I have to assume that he did it uh, with, in his lifetime, I'm saying, not uh, hundreds of years later that I have to assume he had this consciousness. And that is also presumably the reason why so many of his notes have survived. Because I've often seen in later hands from like the 1800s, somebody will write, these are, this is the handwriting of uh, Menachem Azariah Defano. So I, I can't prove, and I would really like to prove this, that, uh, oh, though I will, I don't know if this fits into a legacy, but he will sometimes give explicit instructions to uh, copyists. So he will say, when you're copying this, make sure to move the, this paragraph to over here, or this is copied in the wrong place, make sure to move it over here. But it's more of a scribal sort of uh, thing than I think uh, something broader or grander than uh, a legacy, but I still think it's uh, important. And I'm always on the lookout for it. Thank you. Okay, if that's uh, all for now, I would like to thank Avi one more time for the talk and also to uh, everyone who asked the question.